In this video from Learn Electrics, we'll take a look at electricity generation using a simple approach and easily understandable drawings. The video will be useful to many and especially if you are new to electrics or just want to know a little more about how the electricity gets to your house without getting overcomplicated. The video marries up to two other videos on electricity distribution and usage and we will leave a link to these in the description. Questions about electricity generation and distribution always pop up and some of the more frequent are how do we make electricity and is there a simple way of explaining electricity generation? Why do we have all these high voltage pylons and how does electricity get around the country? We should begin with the question that is asking how we make electricity. We're all familiar with the idea of power stations, turbines and generators, but what is actually happening inside the generators? This is a very basic drawing of a generator. It looks very similar to an electric motor and so it should. A generator converts rotary motion from the rotating turbine shaft into electricity, whilst the motor changes electricity back into rotary motion. Shown here is the stator, the stationary part of the generator. Mounted on the stator will be several electrical coils in pairs as you can see. There is a rotor that rotates and this is basically a big magnet or series of magnets. The rotor will rotate at a fixed frequency so that in the UK for example the output frequency will be 50 Hertz or 50 cycles per second. To complete the circuit in this very simple example we've shown a lamp that will illuminate as electricity is generated. The AC voltage waveform that is generated will be shown along the black line at the top of the drawing. We show here a simple bar magnet that is producing lines of magnetic flux. We've all played with magnets at some time and know that there are these invisible lines of magnetic flux around the magnet. As the magnet lines up with the coils, the lines of flux have their maximum effect upon the coils. As they cut across the coils, electricity is produced, but the magnet must be moving in order to do this. As the magnet rotates, the lines of flux have less effect on the coils, and here we are showing almost no interaction between flux and coils. The voltage will be at a minimum, at zero. As the magnetic bar rotates, the flux will cut across the coils in the opposite direction, producing electricity of the opposite polarity. Positive, negative, positive, negative. Now, the rotor has turned clockwise by a few degrees. As it does this, it's moved closer to the red coils. The magnetic flux lines from the magnetic rotor will cut across the coils and generate some electricity. The voltage begins to increase in a positive direction and the lamp begins to illuminate. The rotor moves further and is now at a maximum interaction with the coil, meaning that the lines of magnetic flux are cutting across the coil at their maximum density. The voltage has reached a peak value and the lamp is at its brightest. As the rotor continues to rotate, it moves away from the red coil and the magnetic flux has less effect on the coils. This means that the voltage begins to fall, as shown at the top. Now the rotor is at the midpoint between the two coils. The first half cycle is complete. The magnetic flux has least effect on the coils, so the voltage drops to zero and the lamp is not illuminated. The next half cycle is a repeat of the previous, but now in a negative direction. As the rotor turns, AC voltage is generated in the opposite sense and the lamp begins to glow. Now the rotor is in line with the red coils and the magnetic flux is cutting across the coils at a maximum. The voltage has peaked at a maximum negative value. The rotor rotates some more and the voltage starts to reduce again and the lamp becomes dimmer. All this is generating electricity of 50 cycles per second in the UK and parts of Europe. 
but it could just as easily be 60 Hz in North America. Because of the frequency, we do not see the lamp glowing and dimming. Our eyes just see one bright light. The rotor has completed one cycle. The voltage has reduced to zero, as you can see at the top of the drawing. And now the whole thing starts again. The voltage begins to grow in a more positive direction as the rotor rotates. It reaches a maximum positive value and the lamp is at its brightest. The rotor rotates further and the voltage begins to drop again. At the midway point, the voltage crosses the zero line. Now it's going in a negative direction. Look at the waveform at the top. It reaches a maximum in the negative direction and starts to fall back towards zero volts. The rotor reaches the midpoint and the voltage crosses the zero line for the whole cycle to start again. Three phase generation is just the same, and the three phase waveforms are the same, there's just more of them. For clarity, we've dispensed with the lamp and the electrical wires. Here is our stator, complete with three pairs of coils. We've called them the red phase, the yellow phase, and the blue phase. The stator holds the coils in position, and they are 120 degrees apart a third of a circle each, and our familiar magnetic rotor will rotate in the middle of the three pairs of coils. The electrical waveforms begin to develop as the rotor rotates. The rotor has moved in a clockwise direction and is now lined up with the yellow coils. The yellow output will be at a maximum. Red and blue will not be at a maximum. Now the rotor is in line with the red coil. The magnetic flux is cutting across the red coils by its maximum amount. With maximum flux, we will have maximum voltage. But blue and yellow are not at a maximum. At this stage, blue is at a maximum. Red is falling towards zero and yellow is increasing. Yellow reaches its maximum voltage as the rotor lines up with the coils. Blue and red are at some midpoint voltage. More rotation and red reaches a maximum in the negative direction. And so the cycles continue. The red peaks, the blue peaks and the yellow peaks. And it all repeats. But they will never all peak at the same time in either the positive or negative direction. Now red peaks positive again and then blue peaks negative, followed by yellow peaking positive, and red peaks in a negative direction. Blue peaks positive, and so on. There are two complementary videos to this video, and they follow what happens to three phase and single phase inside the consumer premises. Well worth watching after this video. Go to learnelectrics.com and in the search box, Enter video 086 or video 087 to view these directly on YouTube. And we will leave the same message in the description to this video. Keeping things simple, let's look at electricity transmission and distribution now. At the power station, electricity will be generated by turning the rotary motion of the turbines and generators into electricity. The output from the generators will be stepped up to 220 or 275,000 volts, even 400,000 volts. It will vary between regions. The electricity then enters the electrical transmission network, the pylons that we see scattered across the landscape, crisscrossing the hills and fields. At or near to places of habitation, towns, cities, and so on, the high voltage will be stepped down to around 33,000 volts, perhaps 25,000 volts for the electrified rail networks. This 33,000 volts is then sent on the distribution network to local substations, where it can be further stepped down to usable voltages. We should not forget the electricity supplier, the purchaser of the wholesale electricity, who then sells it on to us, the users or customers. 
The customers will then use the 230 volt and 400 volt supplies in their homes, offices and industrial units. Some larger factories will require an 11,000 volt supply that they will step down to lower voltages on site. This will avoid too many losses in the cables, as you will see shortly. This is the basics of how it works then. The power station outputs electricity and this is stepped up to 400,000 volts for transmission over long distances, many, many miles. At various points at major substations, the voltage is stepped down to around 33,000 volts and then distributed to local substations. There may be one in a small village, several in a town and hundreds of local substations in big cities. The voltage is stepped down and distributed to homes and businesses in the local area as a usable 230 volts or 400 volts. If this was a coal-fired power station, this is, in simple form, what will happen. Coal is a form of stored chemical energy. We burn the coal and transfer the energy as heat and then use the heat to boil the water inside the boilers. Then we can transfer the steam to the turbine house and the steam then turns the turbines a rotational movement. And because the turbine shaft is connected to the generators, the generators turn. The electricity is produced by magnetic movement of the rotor inside the coils and this electrical energy is transferred to the transmission network of pylons. The Electricity System Operators, or ESO, are responsible for balancing the grid and forecasting demand. They are responsible for making sure that demand is met where it is needed, when it is needed. They control the supply of electricity moving through the transmission network, day by day, second by second, by asking for more generators to be brought online or asking for generators to be turned off as demand falls, perhaps at night. The things that they will consider when forecasting demand will be information such as the weather patterns for the day and the time of year or the time of day or night. Economic trends. Is it a big shopping weekend, a bank holiday and ups and downs of consumer behaviour? The ESO will constantly try to predict this consumer behaviour. They will try to predict what the users will do today, almost to the second. When will there be an extra demand? People coming home from work, putting the heating on, the kettle on, taking a shower, putting the cooker on. If there is a football game on TV tonight, how much extra demand will there be before the game, as viewers make food, make drinks and so on? and then reduce demand during the game. Everyone is watching TV. Nobody moves. And the expected increased demand at half-time as we all put the kettle on again. With the same extra demand after full-time, but what if the game goes to extra time? Now the usage predictions are in disarray. All the plans are messed up, but they have a plan for this. And maybe the extra demand is delayed for 30 minutes or so, because of the extra time. And consider also what happens when the James Bond movie finishes on Christmas Day. The same scenarios. Most of the UK will dash into the kitchen to make a cup of tea. And they will expect the electricity to be there and to work. This is the ESO's job. They must plan for consumption. There are different methods for producing electricity and some of the more popular are listed here. In a future video, we will look at the different methods in more detail. This little graphic shows the route from the power station to your home. There will be variations on this from location to location, but this will give you an idea of what happens. At the local substations, the ones in town or near your home, the three-phase electricity will arrive at something like 32, 33,000 volts. The left half of the transformer is known as a delta configuration. The three windings are arranged in a Greek letter delta formation. Two phases are connected to each other at three points. 
red to yellow, red to blue, and yellow to blue, plus an earth connection, but there is no neutral on this side of the transformer. The other side, the right hand side, is wired as a star configuration. All three windings are connected at a central point called the star point. The earth is also connected at the star point and we now have a neutral connection also at the star point. So we have three phases, L1, L2 and L3 plus neutral plus earth. This is a step down transformer, so our output voltages will be 400 volts three phase and 230 volts single phase. The final question for this video is why do we transmit at 400,000 volts and go through all this palaver of step up and step down transformers? And isn't 400,000 volts a lot more dangerous than 230 volts? Well, let's look. Keeping the maths very simple, if we have one house with a 240 volt supply and a maximum demand of 100 amps, then 1000 houses will require 100,000 amps. To carry 100,000 amps with a 240 volt supply, we will need a cable with a cross-sectional area in excess of one meter. Imagine the weight on the pylons for mile after mile across the landscape and think about the voltage drop in the conductors. It's going to be massive, not to mention the heat generated in the cable as well. And that is just for a thousand homes. In reality, this could be many thousands of properties with many thousands of amps required. So this is what we do. Some very easy calculations. At 240 volts and 100 amps, the house will consume 24,000 watts or 24 kilowatts. We know this from the power formula P equals V times I. So 240 volts multiplied by 100 amps is 24,000 watts. A thousand homes is 1,000 times bigger, so 24 million watts. We also know, ignoring transformer losses, that the wattage across a transformer stays the same. So 24 million watts on the primary or input side will be 24 million watts on the output side, the secondary. We can rearrange watts equals volts times amps to get watts divided by volts equals amps. Now 24 million watts divided by 400,000 volts is just 60 amps of current. This means that supplying 1,000 houses with 100 amps will only require 60 amps of current in the 400,000 volt transmission lines. A lot less current, much smaller cable sizes, less voltage drop and less heat, and a lot less weight for the pylons to support. Win-win all round. And then, at the step-down transformers, we can reduce the voltage and this will increase the available current. Remember, Wattage stays the same across the transformer. If the voltage goes down, the current must go up. And so we end this video, and we hope you've enjoyed it, and thank you for watching. It really is appreciated. Don't forget that there are two other videos with extra related information, and we will leave these links in the description. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos, and remember to click on Notify to be sure of not missing our next video. And you will find even more information, videos and help on our website at learnelectrics.com. And don't forget that you can also type in Learn Electrics, or one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel, so don't miss the next one. And once again, thank you for watching. And we hope to see you again very soon.